Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Compassion in Action webinar series. This is part two in the webinar series, Putting People First, the initial steps for addressing mental illness in faith communities. I'll now turn the presentation over to Shannon Royce. Shannon? Thank you, Ben. I appreciate your help in all the preparation um, and technical assistance on our webinar today. My name is Shannon Royce. I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives, also known as the Partnership Center. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is the second in a series to focus on our newest resource, the Compassion in Action Guide, a guide for faith communities serving people with mental illness and their caregivers. Our first webinar in this series provided an overview of the guide, and we will provide a link to that webinar um, in the follow-up email we send after today's program. Today, we're taking a deeper dive into the first two principles of the guide. We have presenters who exemplify these two principles, and we're anxious to share them with you and so appreciate their being with us today. But first, before I introduce those speakers, let me take care of a few housekeeping items. This is an educational webinar off the record and not intended for press purposes. So if you are a member of the press, we ask that you allow us to connect you with our um, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs after the program. If you're having difficulty hearing today, we find that sometimes people have better sound quality when they call into the phone number offered by Zoom. So if you're having trouble with sound, go ahead and use that phone number instead of connecting through your computer audio. We will be sending a link to the program today. We always get lots of questions about that. So we are recording the program and we'll be sending the link in the follow-up email after our program today. If you have any questions, please um, email us at partnerships with an S, partnerships at hhs.gov. And finally, we have a really full program today and we'll get to as many questions as we can but please share your questions in the question feature at the bottom of your screen, because we will share those with our speakers today, whether we get to all the questions or not. Um, and that way they know how they can better um, make their presentations to address the questions that are coming up. And we can all learn from the kinds of issues that, that you're concerned about. So thank you for joining us. Let's turn uh, next to um, introducing our speakers. Dr. Jason Nusma and Steve Chaplain Steve Sullivan are joining us today. They're both part of the Veterans Affairs Mental Health and Chaplaincy Program, which worked with faith leaders and congregations to make faith communities a place of belonging and community for people with mental illness, including veterans experiencing mental illness. Dr. Jason Nusma is a clinical psychologist who's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University Medical Center and serves as the associate director for the VA Mental Health and Chaplaincy Program. His work focuses on increasing the availability and cultural relevance of evidence-based psychosocial approaches with expertise in health psychology, cross-cultural psychology, dissemination and implementation science, and spirituality and health. That all sounds very important, and we're going to learn a lot from him today. Dr. Nusma has helped to lead multiple national projects to integrate chaplaincy and mental health care services more effectively. Chaplain Sullivan is an ordained Baptist minister who serves as the community coordinator for VA medical health and chaplaincy, where he has led collaborating in care, ministry, and mental health. He has also served as the clergy coordinator for a VA pilot project that seeks to build coalitions between faith communities, mental health communities, and others in rural areas in an effort to reach veterans and their families. And finally, Dr. Sidney Hankerson is the co-director of the Columbia University Wellness Center and assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Hankerson com completed a National Institute of Mental Health funded research fellowship focused on partnering with faith-based organizations to reduce mental health disparities. 
He participated in national dialogues on mental, men's health after publishing the first ever depression screening study in African American churches. This study showed rates of depression in churches comparable to those in urban primary care medical clinics. Today, Dr. Hankerson will talk about addressing the reality of mental illness in the African American community. But first, we're going to learn and listen to Jason and Steve to hear about their program and consider what it means for how faith communities can connect and create a sense of community for individuals with mental illness. Jason, I believe we're going to start with you. Sounds great. Thank you so much um, for that introduction, Shannon. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen here. I'm clicking on that and it says I can't yet while another participant is sharing. Oh, here we go. All right. Get on over. And okay. Um, I'm assuming that people can see these slides and hear me. Uh, Shannon, uh, just come on and interrupt me if uh, that is not the case and, and we'll problem solve the technical difficulties. But I think I have pressed all the correct buttons that I needed to. You look great. Uh, great, good, 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 good. It's always good to have that affirmation when there's not an actual crowd in front of you. You wonder what's happening. I do have a crowd behind me today. This is actually from one of the arms of the project that will be uh, talking about Chaplain Steve Selvin will be talking about. So since we're not uh, permitted to uh, gather in the ways that are depicted behind me, I like to remember that there once was a time when we could do that and hopefully again in the future there will, there will be a, a time like that again. Uh, but in the meantime, we're using Zoom. So uh, as Shannon said, I'm a psychologist, so I'm the mental health part of our mental health and chaplaincy office uh, for purposes of today's presentation and Chaplain Steve Sullivan uh, will uh, kind of anchor the, the chaplain part of the presentation. Uh, so our office, again, as Shannon was noting, is an office out of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, we've been around for a little over a decade now, uh, since 2009, um, and really look at a, a variety of ways, of course, as our um, program office title suggests, of integrating mental health and chaplain services, but also then all the other things kind of entailed within that um, with respect to intersections between religion, spirituality, mental health, overall health, faith communities, clergy. Um, and so as you can see on kind of the bottom part of this slide, our program office engages in educational sorts of endeavors, clinical training, research projects. So for example, we have a fairly large ongoing project right now on moral injury among post 9-11 veterans. Uh, and then some community facing activities. And that's really gonna be the focus of most of what we're talking about today. Um, so with respect to um, a number of things out of our program office, as well as the things that Steve and I will specifically be talking about today, um, all of that can be found at our website. So the link to our website uh, is at the top of the slide here. Uh, if you misplace these slides or you know, can't click on the link or whatever it is, Google mental health and chaplaincy. So just Google our program name, mental health and chaplaincy. Uh, we should be the first thing that pops up uh, and then that'll take you to our uh, program homepage and, and, our, and our menu here. Um, so I'm not gonna highlight everything from our menu, but just do wanna point out a few things that may be of interest to today's audience and then jump into really talking about some of the community outreach stuff. Uh, so in terms of chaplain training um, for uh, many years now, we've offered this, what we call our MIX program, uh, Mental Health Integration for Chaplain Services to VA and DOD chaplains. Um, and starting this year, uh, that training is actually serving as the foundation for a Doctor of Ministry degree or a DEMIN degree through Vanderbilt Divinity School. Um, that will be offered both to VA and military chaplains as well as to uh, civilian chaplains moving forward. Uh, in coming years. So there's information about that at our website. Um, the community outreach materials that Steve and I will be talking about uh, today are available at our website, um, including videos that we'll be talking about. So I encourage you, um, if these sound like something that you could make use of, to 
uh, look those up on our, our website um, and see what you can do with those. In addition to the videos that we'll be talking about, we also have other videos on that website, including some videos on upstream suicide prevention. Um, some of our faith communities that have used the faith community videos we'll be talking about have also used these upstream suicide prevention videos uh, for discussion. So would want to put your attention to those. And then finally, um, like so many organizations now uh, in the rest of the world, we have a, a section of our website on uh, response to COVID-19 that we've really tried to include materials um, that are um, hopefully most useful to uh, faith communities and clergy uh, within that part of, part of our website. So just wanna highlight uh, some of those resources. So primarily what um, Steve and I will be talking about today is uh, this program um, that we've been leading for the past two or three years now. It's a project that's been funded by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, um, where we looked at equipping faith communities and clergy to care for both veterans and persons with mental health problems. Um, we did this um, via two different project arms. So you can see there at the bottom of the slide, the, the two different project arms. Uh, so the project arm I'll be talking about was the one where we targeted uh, faith communities with our A Place to Call Home series. Um, and I think in, in many ways, the um, title for you know, part two with, with today's webinar, the putting people first, uh, I think that title is so synergistic with exactly uh, the kinds of things that we were trying to do um, across this project, both arms of this project, and, and really specifically uh, in the first arm of this project uh, with some of the work uh, that I'll be talking about in faith communities. Uh, and then Steve Sullivan will talk more about the collaborating and care arm of our project where we brought together uh, mental health professionals and clergy uh, to think about ways that they could uh, collaborate better. And that is, that's actually uh, the image that you see behind me here. This was an event that we uh, held in Atlanta, maybe about a year ago now. So in terms of just a little bit of background, um, there's so much that could be uh, talked about here. Um, you know, as we think about intersections between religion, spirituality, health, mental health. Um, so this, what, I, what I have listed is barely even scratching the surface of some of the research that's out there. Uh, but one of the things that we know is that faith communities for millions of people um, across the globe and here in the United States provide places of meaning, belonging. They provide people with a sense of purpose, with a sense of life direction often. Uh, and from the research, um, what we've seen is that this often comes along with a number of health benefits and psychosocial benefits. Uh, the, the one thing that I've uh, kind of cited here, we could cite so many things. This is just one citation at the bottom of the slide from the Alameda County study, which was a longitudinal study in this county in California, where they followed people over decades of their life. They looked at a host of different things. There's hundreds of publications from this longitudinal study, including multiple publications looking just at religion and spirituality. One of the things that they found with this study is that individuals who are more involved in faith communities, who attend religious services more often and this kind of thing, that they lived longer, that they had a number of better health behaviors, that they had better psychosocial kinds of health outcomes. Um, and so on the whole, the research, and we could go through lots more of research like this, seems to suggest that there's something you know, beneficial in, in terms of health outcomes. Now, of course, there's lots of nuance within how to interpret some of this and think about this information. I'm sure all of us and all of you on the webinar today can probably think about somebody in your life, somebody for whom being part of a religious community or, or a faith community maybe wasn't necessarily a positive impact in their life uh, for a period of time. So the, the research is not saying that, oh, for everybody all the time, this is going to be positive. There, there are ways, of course, we're human beings that, that uh, this, you know, 
religion, faith, and being part of a community isn't always going to work out wonderfully for people. But on the whole, the research does tend to suggest um, some, some positive sorts of health outcomes, including uh, when we look at um, suicide and suicide prevention, which is, of course, something from the VA side, working with veterans and service members uh, that we're quite interested in and concerned about. Uh, so there are a number of factors that protect against suicide just some here listed on the slide, including social belonging, sense of meaning and purpose, and religion and spirituality. Uh, and so all of those things are things that faith communities can provide. So as I noted in uh, the first arm of our study, we used four different videos. Um, so each video was 20 minutes uh, in length. And you can see the different titles here. So partners in care, trauma, moral injury, and belonging. And the faith communities tended to have, you know, half a dozen to a dozen participants each. Uh, and they would watch the video um, and then discuss the video amongst themselves. So they'd watch the 20 minute video and then have somewhere between, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, some groups even an hour of discussion on the different topics that were brought up in the video. And this theme of belonging, the fourth video that the top of that video really was a theme that pervaded the entire series. So many of the questions that um, faith community participants were focusing on was thinking about how can we create places of belonging um, for, of course, veterans and persons uh, with mental health problems within our faith community. Again, those videos are available on our website. So what we did as part of the study and a little bit of the, the data that I'm gonna show here in a minute we had five pilot sites, and then we had 20 project sites that we collected data from. Uh, we are still cleaning the data from the project sites. So the data that I'm uh, sharing with you here is uh, data that we collected from those five project sites, or, or pilot sites initially. Um, and what we saw from uh, those pilot sites was uh, encouragingly, you know, 90% or so of, of people who participated in the series said that as a result of doing that, they were more likely to support efforts in their congregation aimed at helping veterans and persons uh, with mental health problems. Uh, we did pre-post assessments. So we did a pre-assessment um, when before they watched the first video. So typically faith communities would watch these, you know, one per week kind of a thing, perhaps part of a Sunday school or a special Wednesday night gathering uh, or something like that. Uh, so we did a pre-assessment at the beginning and then we did a, did a post-assessment at the end of the fourth week. Uh, and these are just, again, a few selected things that we found. So encouragingly there, uh, significant increase from the uh, beginning of the series to the end um, among participants feeling like they could do a better job of supporting people with mental health mental health problems uh, within their faith community. Uh, and then we saw a number of different things that kind of pointed to uh, feeling like, yeah, maybe, maybe our community um, is doing or could do a better job of creating space to hear people's stories um, and to allow people, you know, as, as this bottom bullet speaks to, to allow people who may feel like they don't fit the mold uh, to, to feel like they belong and they're welcome here and they can, they can share their story. Uh, there were also a couple of places on, on our pre-post tests where we actually saw, you know, modest decline. These are still very, um, you know, large percentages of people agreeing with these uh, statements, uh, both at the pre and the post. Um, so there was modest decline in people agreeing with the statement of, I believe we make new people feel at ease and the statement, I feel that people in our congregation can care about mental health problems. And when we talked to uh, participants and, and the facilitators who led these, um, di these different uh, videos and the discussions, what we learned was that often the participants were having these discussions of, can I actually share about some of the things that I've gone through? you know, depression or, you know, my, whether it's me or my mother or my husband, you know, some folks saying, I haven't always felt comfortable sharing that um, at church and bringing that to the faith community. So I think some of the thing that we're actually seeing here is recognition of, hmm, maybe our community could do actually a little bit better job uh, of making it clear that this is a place where people 
can feel welcome, can belong, uh, including people um, who sometimes can have, have difficulty um, finding belonging uh, within communities, including folks with mental health issues. Uh, here are just a couple of uh, quotes from different participants. So um, from the, the first one here is from a veteran participant. Uh, and I, I just like the piece here of, you know, within VA, we often say thanks for your service. And I think there's a way to say that that is genuine and meaningful. Um, but this veteran was saying, you know, this notion of welcome home and how much more meaningful that is, you know, thanks for your service can kind of have a way of saying thank you. And you sort of, you can stay over there. I've thanked you. Welcome home is a, you know, that's an invitation to come in. That's an invitation uh, to belong. So really embodying. Uh, that spirit. And this, this second um, participant here, a, a little bit on the same theme, but talking about how belonging involves actually doing church together. On the final you know, piece of this, this quote here, I feel like I belong when I feel like I contribute. So we, we often think about how do we care for people in this other group? I think it's worth asking as well, how can we facilitate people contributing? so that they can feel like they belong and they can feel like they're contributing as well. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hand it over to Chaplain uh, Steve Sullivan to talk about the other arm of what we did and wrap up the presentation. Okay, well, we did this, the main thing I worked with was this Collaborating in Care program, Ministry and Mental Health. And the idea was to get a room full of community clergy and community mental health people together and we it was led by brief videos we had you know some of the same videos we used uh, in the faith community uh, project that Jason mentioned so there was video content that guided it but it really was discussion oriented we forced the mental health people to sit at the same tables with uh, the clergy um, and there was a lot of this is kind of the stepchild of the BMSF project. In some ways, there was a lot of skepticism. You know, I don't want to get people to actually come, these community mental health people, you know, they got to make money during the week, clergy are busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were shocked at how many people came. I guess we had, the range was maybe 20 to 56 uh, across the country. We did, I think, three pilots, and then you can see the locations we did those. And this is the funniest thing I think I've done maybe in ministry, um, just to see these dynamic safe places where discussions happen took place, uh, where people were able to say their impressions. We talk about cross impressions. We talk about impressions of each other, impressions of ourselves. Most, most of the time they were more self-deprecating, especially clergy about themselves than, than they were critical of mental health, but there was some of that as well just trying to build trust and, 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 uh, and reduce some of that suspicion. Uh, we know y'all are not going to be able to create these, uh, you know, well, here's, we're going to look at these demographics here, clergy and mental health. That was who we invited, right? We thought we're going to get straight up clergy, straight up mental health. We might get a few VA people, but we want to limit the VA people. We really wanted community mental health people in that local community so that they could build those relationships of trust. Um, so that's really what we were going for. But what we got was something a little bit different, uh, a little bit different demographic. Uh, and our clergy was 153 to mental health, 128, which was pretty darn close, pretty darn even. We were shocked about that. We thought the mental health numbers might be a lot lower, but we got way more diversity than we thought we would have. Um, you can see these, some of these stats up here are not as, maybe not as useful as, as others, but, you know, only 68% were, I would say, legitimate clergy. We had a lot of lay leadership, church staff, and I've been working, trying to train clergy for uh, 10, 12 years. And, you know, I'm now reducing my expectations to, we're just looking for a few good clergy. If you've got lay people in community, if you've got veterans, if you've got Vietnam veterans that can build intergenerational relationships, these are the kind of people you really want to focus on and try to get together and, and, and train. And you can see the diversity on the mental health side. We got social workers, psychologists, uh, there are a lot of these are behavioral health specialists, a nurse, uh, peer support, LPC. So we had lots of kinds of dem demographics, but that made for interesting discussion. And I will say, um, you know, one thing about, you know, we, we don't expect you all to 
uh, we had some money to do this, right? So it costs money to feed these folks and to make these connections and to go out there and do these trainings. We, we don't expect you in your local areas probably to try anything this ambitious. This all kind of started in my mind from what we did with, in uh, Arkansas 10 years ago in a, a small town in Russellville. And I call them pew and couch lunches or pew versus the couch lunches. We had mental health and clergy didn't know each other in a small town, didn't like each other. And we just got in the back of a Western Sizzlin got it to my church to pay for it and let them go at it. And just some of that trust that built from those relationships kind of planted a seed in my mind that something on a grander scale like this might actually work. And this was just exciting. It really did work. So I just want to toot that horn. Um, uh, and then some of the lessons learned uh, from these experiences that we've had is introspection and vulnerability um as as precursors to really making this work um we found a lot of uh you know a lot of people and a lot of the faith communities had to do this introspection and honestly you know as jason mentioned a lot of them said why would we want to welcome veterans to talk in our sunday school class i don't even talk in my sunday school class you know they, they realize we you know there's kind of this idealistic oh let's just target the faith communities i mean we're in demand all the time to, to, to do stuff because we're the faith. Oh, let's bring in the faith people. The churches are awesome. But, you know, it's kind of uh, a little nuanced. You know, some are and some aren't. Um, and then there's just a lot of vulnerability that was involved in this program. People sharing, people being honest, veterans being honest uh, with their experiences with clergy, with mental health. Um, and then integrating the project arms we found was really useful. And that, that slide that Jason made that integrates them, there's one of them that has cute fingers. And I just was amazed that it was the least academic slide he's ever made. And I just applaud him for it. But I think integrating these project arms has really been, been great because we can do a collaborating in care, a large scale training. And then we have these videos right here and say, okay, any of y'all, you know, want to do the faith community thing in your own community. It gives them a natural next step because there's nothing worse than these one-off trainings where you drop your notebook in your trunk and then you see it at Easter. We really try to finish with next steps and try to specific who's going to email who, who's going to meet with who in this community. And that was one of the exciting things about it. Engaging leadership that can help set the example and don't expect your leadership to organize your pastor to organize this or even to be there. But to mention it from the pulpit, to give his blessing or her blessing, my daughter's a female minister, I gotta be careful here, to give their blessing, to show up one of the four meetings, whatever. Just to, you know, that that's huge. Um, and then to create this space to listen. Ain't nobody listens to anybody anymore. You know, I got three or four people that listen to me and I think just making a space to listen, um, that's all veterans. Uh, and a lot of times mental health folks are looking for. And then knowing the resources in your community, faith and local, that's a good next step thing. When you, if you're gonna use these videos, try these project out, just know a few community resources and they're there. There's community almost everywhere. There's a community coalition to support veterans. There's VA outreach program uh, folks. Um, there's VFWs that are good. There's, uh, you know, Legion, American Legion Community Service, uh, veteran service officers that are hugely helpful for helping veterans get benefits, get access to the VA. I'm going to wrap it with that. We've gone a little over, but if y'all got any interest, um, we hope to have downloaded some materials we weren't really able to, but email us at mhc at va.gov. If you want some of these faith community videos, I'll ship them out to you. Um, and then there's our website there too. And Shannon, we really appreciate you uh, giving us this chance to share. Appreciate y'all joining us. We know this is not easy work, working with faith communities, but it is rewarding. And it's time we came together to treat veterans and those with mental health in a truly holistic fashion. Thank y'all. Thank you, Steve. Uh, what you and Jason have shared is really so perfect in setting up principle one, which is the principle of inherent dignity and really recognizing that people with mental illness and veterans coming home, the welcome home, I loved that, Jason. I thought that was really a warm way to welcome people. And that would apply to people with mental illness as well, just to say welcome to them. Uh, people with mental illness want a sense of belonging and a sense of community 
just like all the rest of us do. So that was really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Sydney, we're turning it over to you now, man. I wanna hear about the next principle. So tell us about that. I am not hearing you. Hello, Shannon, can you hear me there now? There he is, yes, sir, I can hear you now. All right, very good. Uh, thank you so much um, for the warm introduction. And if Ben could please um, run my slides. I'm speaking through the phone, had a, a little bit of technical difficulties. Okay, so you all can see me speaking through the phone. And we'll get this going. We're just grateful you're with us, Dr. Hankerson. We'll just oh. we're all used to these technical challenges of living in a Zoom world. So Ben will get your slides going. There it is. There all we right. go. Okay. Thank away. you so much. And thank you for the flexibility on the fly, Ben. You're definitely, and Amita, my project coordinator, you're both lifesavers. Um, so first I'd like to, uh, to say that, you know, Dr. Nusma's uh, and Chaplain Steve's presentation really laid a wonderful foundation uh, to go over uh, today's talk. And today I'm going to be going over principle two of, uh, of the guide, which is acknowledging mental illness as an illness. Next slide. Uh, so I've broken my talk into three main parts. First, we'll quickly go through what Principle 2 uh, actually says and try to highlight some of the key concepts from the principle and then really emphasize the burden and some of the, the causes of mental illness. And then lastly, leave you with some church-based solutions with a focus on African-American faith-based communities. Next slide. So Principle 2 of the guide, the illness principle, is that we acknowledge mental illness as an illness. And so mental illness uh, results from a complex interaction of biological, psychological, and environmental factors. Next slide. Uh, mental illnesses are actually diagnosed by a mental health or medical professional and can be very, very serious, as we'll see in terms of disability, and can be life-threatening as it relates to uh, potentially lethal outcomes of suicide. Next slide. Uh, mental illness is not a lack of belief in a higher power or a result of, or of sin or wrongdoing, which is an important concept. Next slide. And we will take advantage of opportunities to learn about different mental health conditions as well as their signs and symptoms. Next slide. And lastly, we will learn how to participate in the lives of people with mental illness and provide care and support when needed. Next slide. So that is an overview of what Principle 2 is, and I think it wonderfully highlights the multiple causes of mental illness, the impact of mental illness and how debilitating they can be, and it really emphasizes the church's role, uh, faith-based organizations' unique role to support and care for people uh, with mental illness in their various houses of worship. And so now we're going to talk about, in a little greater detail, the burden and causes of mental illness. Next slide. So when we define what mental illness is, next slide, um, the, the guide really breaks it down into a, a definition that is used by the American Psychiatric Association which is a national network of psychiatrists that I am actually a member of. Um, and the American Psychiatric Association dis defines a mental illness as a health condition that involves significant changes in a person's emotions in their thinking and their behavior. So that is one of the core features of all mental illnesses is that they can affect a person's feelings or emotions, how they think and how they behave or act. Uh, next. Another important component of mental illness is that they can cause distress, significant distress as we'll see, and or problems uh, in functioning in social areas of life, in work, and in uh, activities with your family. And so when we talk about mental illness, this is the actual definition of mental illness. Next slide. 
And so it's important to know that mental illnesses are common. Could you hit next? Uh, one in five uh, adults in the United States experiences a mental illness each year, and the guide wonderfully points out how if you have a congregation of 100 people, at least 20 people um, in that house of worship are likely to have a mental illness at any one time. Mental illness um, in the United States in, young, in youth, age six to seven, um, have a mental illness each year. So one in six, so it's very common um, in our youth. And again, emphasizing how mental illnesses impact um, young people, 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses begin by age 14. So we're really getting a, a better sense of the importance of addressing mental illnesses in our youth. Next slide. So we know what mental illnesses are now, uh, and now we'll talk about how devastating they can be. Uh, you know, a landmark study from the World Health Organization in 2015 showed that mental illnesses are actually the number one cause of disability in the world. And when you talk about disability, we're talking about, in this study, they looked at um, years lived with disability, or years lived in pain, years lived in suffering, and years lived in impairment. And of all the illnesses in the world, mental illnesses cause the greatest amount of disability in terms of years lived with disability worldwide. So these are severely debilitating illnesses. Next slide. Um, and especially in the African American community, um, the burden or disability among mental illness has filtered down um, to the youngest of, in our communities. Um, a study that came out just last year showed that the suicide attempt rate in African-American youth um, has increased 73% uh, between 1991 to 2017. 73% increase in suicide attempts in African-American youth. During that same period, um, the suicide attempt rate among Caucasian youth actually decreased 7.5%. And so I highlight this to show um, that, uh, you know, suicide and, and the, the consequences or attempting suicide can be a, a, a tragic consequence of mental illnesses and have filtered down um, to the youngest of those in the African-American community. Next slide. So in terms of risk factors for mental illness, um, you know, the guide talks about three main causes and how mental illnesses are really um, a complex interaction of three different types of causes. So the first is environmental causes. Um, so where you live, where you work, where you play, or where you pray, um, which we commonly think of as social determinants of health. This is a picture of, uh, of the Bronx. You can see the Manhattan skyline in the distance. Um, in New York City, where uh, I live and work, um, the Bronx actually is one of the poorest um, United States congressional districts in the country. Um, and as you can imagine, um, having limited access to, um, you know, good paying jobs, to, to housing instability, um, to education, um, all of these social factors and these environmental factors um, contribute as a risk factor uh, for a person developing a mental illness. Next slide. And so that, that's kind of the environmental piece. Another key part or risk factor for mental illnesses is the biological piece or genetics. Um, so next slide. So when we think about that, we're talking about uh, our family history. So um, mental illnesses are some of the most um, highly heritable conditions in all of medicine, for example. If a family member has bipolar disorder, um, if they have a child, uh, that child is significantly at increased risk of developing bipolar disorder compared to someone who doesn't have uh, bipolar disorder. Schizophrenia is also uh, very, um, tends to run in families. And so our family history and our genetics uh, play an important part in developing mental illnesses. Next slide. And it's important to note that mental illnesses are diseases of the brain. And so this slide really highlights some of the key neurotransmitters or um, we'll say brain chemicals 
uh, that are associated with um, mental illnesses. Um, for example, in depression, um, we're all probably aware of what's called serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors, um, the most common class of, uh, of antidepressants um, like Prozac and Zoloft. Um, we know that low levels of serotonin in the brain increase the risk of a person developing um, depression. Uh, also, dopamine um, and noradrenaline in particular are associated with depression. And so as we talk about the biological risk or contributors to mental illnesses, it's important to know that these are brain diseases um, and that it's important that we're aware of how some of these neurotransmitters, either um, in low levels or at increased levels, can contribute to mental illnesses. Next slide. And then lastly is psychological uh, contributors uh, to ment the development of mental illnesses. Um, and when I talk about that, uh, the example I'll, I'll talk about is early childhood trauma or adverse childhood experiences. Uh, this picture highlighting a little girl who looks like she's just terrified, uh, looks like a man in the background drinking an alcoholic beverage. We know um, from the classic ACEs study um, that children that are exposed to adverse childhood experiences, and what we mean by that is if they are exposed to physical or sexual abuse, if they have a parent with a mental illness or who's incarcerated, or if that child experiences some type of physical or emotional neglect, that they are at significantly higher odds of developing a mental illness. They're also at significantly higher odds at developing other common chronic medical conditions, whether it's hypertension, diabetes, obesity. And so the psychological makeup in our early years are tremendously informative um, in the development of, of mental illnesses. Next slide. So that kind of covers the, the burden and, and causes of mental illnesses. And now to the good news, which is uh, what houses of worship um, can do and how faith-based organizations are uniquely positioned uh, to provide solutions and support community members experiencing mental health conditions. Next slide. So first, it's important to note that in the United States, regardless of a person's race or ethnicity, regardless of their religious affiliation, more people, when they are first experiencing symptoms of a mental illness, seek help from faith leaders more so than going to seek help from mental health professionals. So our clergy, our pastors, our rabbis, our imams are really frontline mental health professionals. And so houses of work, worship are uniquely positioned to address and support uh, mental illness um, in people, among people in their community. Next slide. However, um, we have to acknowledge how sometimes um, faith has been used negatively or could be used to deter someone from seeking help for a mental health problem. Um, in, the, in the Christian faith tradition, um, which I um, am a member of, um, oftentimes some you know, houses of worship will ascribe mental illnesses to personal sin or to a lack of faith. Well, someone may be, you know, people may say that someone is depressed because they're not praying enough or because they don't have enough faith. Or someone may say that, uh, you know, a congregant is using substances just because of sin. And so I think it's important to acknowledge how, uh, although houses of worship are really entry points for supporting people with mental health conditions, Sometimes our, our faith traditions can be barriers and hurtful barriers to people with mental illness. And so it's important for us to acknowledge that history and really transform that history one into one of openness and acceptance. Next slide. So what can churches do? You know, as outlined in the guide, uh, one solution is to pursue education and training. Um, you can hit it twice. Um, uh, mental health first aid, uh, the first source for education and training is, um, you know, an evidence-based uh, mental health literacy program that is designed to teach people the signs and symptoms of common mental health problems uh, and gives them, you know, a plan of support for connecting them to care. 
The Suicide uh, Prevention Resource Center is also an important resource, especially in light of the alarming suicide rates among African-American youth that I alluded to er earlier. And then the clinical support system for serious mental illness. Uh, we talked about how debilitating mental illnesses can be. So these are all resources that Houses of Worship can access uh, for education and training. Next slide. And I want to focus a little bit more in depth on mental health first aid. So I work very closely with uh, faith leaders um, in Harlem, New York, and we have trained um, close to 300 uh, community members uh, recruited largely from churches in Harlem in mental health first aid. Um, so it has been very effective at increasing awareness about common mental health problems, about reducing stigma, uh, which we know is a common barrier uh, for people in faith-based settings to seek care, as well as going over the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety and common mental health problems. And importantly, just like CPR, Mental Health First Aid equips people with a five-step action plan of how to assist and connect to care someone experiencing a mental health crisis. Next slide. So Mental Health First Aid really gives, you know, the general public, it's designed for the general public, the tools to be able to identify and support someone who may be at risk for experiencing a, a depressive episode and to understand and be able to recognize and respond to the risk factors for suicide, as well as psychosis, anxiety disorders, including trauma, which we talked about earlier, which are especially uh, devastating in our youth, as well as substance use disorders. Um, so really it gives you the tools to be able to identify and respond and support people experiencing these common mental health conditions. Next slide. Another thing that churches can do is to really leverage the expertise in your local community. And I know that we have people from across the country on today's webinar. And so we've developed a five-step strategy to really, uh, that we've called FAITH, uh, this acronym, to leverage the expertise in your community. Um, and so the first step of engagement or leveraging that expertise is to form a strong partnership. It's important for faith leaders to form partnerships with mental health providers in their, in their community and in their networks and really be in this for the long haul. Um, so really forming a strong partnership. And then the second aspect is to assess the community's needs. Um, that assessment can take place through just talking to people in the community or conducting formal surveys, but really identifying what are the most pressing mental health problems in that community is important. And then identifying leaders who will support the initiative. Um, I would, you know, it's important to note that without the support of the lead pastor, um, it's next to impossible uh, to leverage expertise in your community. So identifying the lead pastor as well as other leaders who will support the promotion of mental health in community. And then taking time to set the context. We've talked about how important it is uh, to honor the in individual. And we've acknowledged how um, harmful some houses of worship can be towards people experiencing mental illnesses. And so it's important to take time to set the context and really create safe spaces for talking about mental illness. And lastly, honor the community's culture. Uh, whatever the historical uh, you know, context is, it's important to honor that culture. So that's the process that we use to try to engage and leverage the expertise in our local community. Next slide. Um, and then lastly, um, putting compassion into action. One way that you can do that, and probably the most powerful way for all the faith leaders on the webinar today, share your journey with mental illness, whether it's your own journey or the journey of a family member or the journey um, shared anonymously of uh, someone in your house of worship. Hearing a positive experience of someone who overcame a mental health challenge can be one of the most powerful ways to reduce the stigma of mental illness and put compassion into action. And then connecting with mental health and medical professionals who you trust and who will honor your faith traditions uh, to be able to accurately in a culturally sensitive way diagnose um, mental illnesses and then you could host one of the mental health training programs that we alluded to earlier. 
So these are concrete ways that you can put compassion into action. Next slide. Um, and then in terms of increasing access to care, one of the things that we're most proud of in our community in Manhattan is that one of the churches that, with whom we partner actually opened a freestanding mental health clinic called the Hope Center. Um, it's a faith-based clinic uh, staffed uh, by um, social workers and psychologists and, and have connections to psychiatrists at Columbia that provides free evidence-based psychotherapy for community members in Harlem. And so this is uh, obviously on the far end, you know, of increasing access. But I share this with you all as a way of um, letting you know what's possible and helping you to hopefully inspire you to dream big about ways of um, increasing access through partnerships with faith uh, and mental health professionals. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the next slide and go to the summary. So in closing, key points to remember, um, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today, but if you remember nothing else, uh, remember this, is that mental illnesses, you know, truly are um, medical conditions that result from a complex interaction of the environment, of a person's biology and family history, and psychological fa factors. Mental illnesses can be very serious. We talked about how mental illnesses are the number one cause of disability in the world. And actually one of the tragic and fatal consequences of mental illnesses is a person taking their own life. So it's important that we honor how debilitating and serious mental illnesses can be. And, you know, mental illnesses are health conditions and they're, you know, properly diagnosed by a mental health or medical professional. And so it's important to engage with health and mental health professionals who will honor your faith tradition as well as honor your culture. And with that, uh, I want to leave everyone with this uh, message of hope, which is from my uh, favorite scripture. Um, uh, the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I share that, uh, you know, it's often countercultural for our houses of worship to be talking about mental illness. Um, but I truly believe that we're on a transformative journey, and I really thank Shannon and Ben and, and their leadership for creating spaces and a systematic process by which we can truly turn and transform compassion into action. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Stay with us there because we'll turn to questions momentarily. I really appreciate Hang on there. We're going to need you to do questions. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I appreciate your um, your great explanation of principle two, especially the focus on the environmental, biological, psychological, the complexity of that. Um, you know, our Surgeon General, Surgeon General Jerome Adams has commented yes. that a child's zip code is more important than their DNA code when it comes to illness. And I think we really have to keep in mind the complexity of dealing with the um, the issues that you raised. So thank you so much. If we can have Chaplain Steve and Jason come back on the screen for us, we'll do a couple of questions. And the first one, Sydney, I'm going to start with this first one as they join us, um, because you really touched on it a bit in your presentation. And that is there was curiosity about how the different programs that you run and Jason and Steve run how they play out differently in different settings. So you're in the New York City area, but how would these kinds of programs play out, for instance, in New York City versus rural America versus the Bible Belt? So that was a question that came up. We'd love to have y'all address. Shannon, my video has been stopped by the host, so I don't know what that means, but I can't turn it back on. Just, but I can go audio. Ben can help us with that probably. He'll try if he can. Okay, Sydney, you and Jason speak, sure. you can speak up as well. Yeah. Uh, so thank whoever asked that, for that question. Um, in terms of the different contexts, in terms of New York City versus a rural area versus the Bible Belt, uh, I think that all of these uh, trainings are wonderfully transferable. Uh, the thing that I would add is I think that depending on whatever uh, part of the country you're in, it's important to um, that step of faith, setting the context and honoring the community's culture are very, very important. 
uh, as a note of context, I grew up in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, um, and went to medical school in Atlanta, so the heart of the Bible Belt, really. And um, I do think that um, it, those are very different, you know, communities, obviously very different from New York City. So it really depended heavily on uh, the pastor's guidance and helping us to set the context. For example, instead of talking about depression, we do a lot of work with depression, we advertise and market all of our trainings as initially talking about stress because everyone can um, acknowledge that they're stressed out, but it's harder for people to acknowledge that they may be struggling with depression. So that's one way to really um, set the context, depending on where you are. That's very helpful. Thank you. Jason or Steve, do you have any? Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I grew up in Arkansas and it's been most of my life in rural area, Sydney, and you know, Atlanta's southern but not rural. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, you have the northern. I mean, it's kind of cool to have a therapist and everything in certain urban areas, and everybody kind of accepts that. But you know, I had a veteran tell me, you know, look, I'll drive my truck to next county to talk to somebody, but don't make me park mm. in that clinic down. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. I found the stigma is greater around mental illness. Uh, resources are fewer by far in rural areas, so pulling this off, uh, this collaboration off, is a little bit trickier, but not impossible. You know, and um, certainly I made a strong effort to try to bring those coalitions together, uh, and it worked. And it worked. It's still working in a few instances, but uh, anyway, it's just a little different dynamic in the rural area, I'd say. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, it's, it's such a great question. I noticed some of the other questions too, kind of related a little bit to this one of okay, what do we do in a you know, faith community where the pastor says, oh, you know, bipolar disorder is overrated. You know, it's just a spiritual deficit or something like that. Um, and <laughs> there is such variation within different faith communities. Some of that has to do with denominations. Some of that has to do with geography. Some of that has to do with rural urban, you know, all these sorts of things as to whether that's going to be a challenge or not. And the degree to which mental illness as an illness is, oh, yeah, 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 we already get that within this congregation, or, oh, that's, you know, that's a radical idea for us, that there's a, there's a real spectrum along those lines, and I think, you know, one, one of the things to, to balance with all of that is, is making sure that the, the messaging is not doing anything that's going to be exclusionary for folks, right, because it, at the end of the day, we, we want to make sure that, that people can find the help, you know, like Sydney was saying, that they feel like they can go to their pastor with these concerns and talk about them instead of not, right? Uh, so yeah, they, they go to clergy before they go to mental health. And then there's a lot of people that go to nobody, right? So clergy can do a lot to, to you know, set the frame of you can, you can be safe to talk about those things here at all. And any, I, I think just all of this does point to the importance of locally knowing where you are, building relationships in the communities that you're in, because each community is going to be different and, and is going to have different points of, of tension with, with some of these topics. Yeah, I, re- I really appreciate that. I think one of the reasons that we took on drafting the guide and we, it took us a while to bring it to closure because we were really working carefully to balance what we were seeing in faith communities around the United States, the different perspectives that we see in those faith communities. Uh, There are some faith communities who probably will not care to read or use our guide at all. And there are other faith communities that we hope will be open to it and um, interested in learning more. Those are the faith communities we're really seeking to reach because the federal government, it's not our job to tell faith communities what they should and should not believe, right? Um, But we will bring the best science that we have to bear, uh, to share with them uh, the things that we know from science, and that that is the role that we can play here in this office. There are so many questions that have come up, but another one that continually is an issue of concern is what about faith leaders who are struggling themselves with a mental health challenge? What what would be your response or your counsel to that faith leader who may be struggling himself or herself? 
I think Chaplain Steve, if you want to yeah. take that one. Oh, Chaplain. You're going to toss that to me. <laughs> wow. you know, that is the art of Zoom, learning to toss. <laughs> well, I've been talking, you know, I've had, I've gotten pastors together in areas and I've had them say that, look, I don't even want to talk or counsel a couple of my church anymore because as soon as I do, I know too much. They leave and go to another church. So in some instances, referring, you know, congregants to other pastors has worked. Jason and I, you know, this is an idea I've been kicking around for a long time called Intimate Anonymity. Um, and Jason's working on this paper now with me. And basically, we found out better. We did clergy trainings for five years, the community clergy training program. And the people who showed up were not clergy as much. We had an equal number of veterans. And they would share things. And, and I'd have wives come up to me after and say, he never told me about that in his whole life. And they would leave. And it was because it was a one-off training. Now, right. on the other side, we were trying to build these support groups and churches for veterans through this PTSD foundation and couldn't get anybody to come. So I started to think, man, there's something into this, you know, intimate anonymity kind of thing. Like, I'm going to talk to somebody I don't even know. So if you're a pastor that's struggling, I'd almost suggest finding a pastor. I have one guy go out of state, uh, but out of community, somebody you don't know that you're not going to see and work with on a regular basis. It's not a part of your ministerial network. Go to that person and confide to them. You know, that would be my advice. And I think in those situations, you get somebody at least to share some of this burden you have. Um, and that, that's, that's all I got on that one. But that's a really tricky thing. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate that. One of the pastors we work with um, was a pastor for many years. He was a gentleman who struggled with depression and continued very openly with his congregation. But he recently left that congregation and is now starting a ministry in his denomination, specifically for other pastors who are struggling with any kind of mental health concerns. So there, there are um, programs and people to connect with out there. Steve, I appreciate your mentioning that. Sydney, do you have other things to say? Um. Well, I, I think Steve really hit the nail on the head is um, finding someone who you can connect with um, in uh, an anonymous way. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, that would be my suggestion as well. Mm -hmm. Let's take one more question and then we're going to close out. This has been so good, guys. Thank you so much. Um, what about best practices for helping faith communities to overcome the barriers to address mental illness? What would you recommend to get faith communities to overcome those barriers? I, I would say to have a child who has a mental illness. <laughs> I mean, a dog in the fight. A, I mean, that's the, ideally finding someone in your congregation. Who would share? Or, you know what I mean? Who's experienced mm -hmm. it. That I mean, that's just nothing changes the dynamic more than that. I mean, look at Rick Warren and what all he's done yeah. there in California yeah. mm -hmm. with his son's suicide. I mean, there you got a. I'm mm -hmm. a I'm a Baptist, not not Southern Baptist, but there you've got a Southern Baptist conservative, probably skeptical mental illness kind of guy, and his kid goes through this, and it's a game changer. And I'm not saying every congregation has that, or you want to bring that to any congregation, but I will say that's one thing that's overcoming some barriers. I will. Um, so anyway, just, that's my comment, but Shannon, uh, Sydney, right. uh, Jason, y'all might want to. The have... Warrens have been really key leaders. Right. I agree. Yeah. They've been really key leaders in opening the conversation as they grieved very openly and out loud for the nation, really, um, and for the faith community to see. And they were well known across denominations because of their work in HIV and AIDS around the world. They were really known internationally. So their leadership on this issue has been uh, a game changer, I think, really yeah. significant. Well, I, would, I would second that. I, I was fortunate to, um, a couple of weeks ago, to speak with Kay Warren through her Hope for Mental Health community and did a presentation on racism and mental health disparities, actually. Mm -hmm. And so they have been um, just transformational as it relates to talking about mental health and creating spaces for mental health. Um, and I think that really brings home the point of having the pastor um, talk about the importance of mental health from the pulpit. 
and uh, the, the church that created the Hope Center, the lead pastor talks about how he sees a therapist um, and how uh, several year, years ago he was extremely depressed. He suffers from a chronic medical condition, has to take prednisone chronically, um, and he talks about that deep, deep despair and how it really um, conflicted with his faith beliefs. But he went to see a past uh, therapist. He talks openly about it. And I think the, pat the churches with whom we've had the most success and the longest partnerships, it has been either a pastor or a trusted church member who has shared their story, either personally or through their family members. Right. And I say it doesn't have to be from the pulpit in any kind of formal overt sense, but just in a Wednesday night prayer, just dropping mental illness or in a pastoral prayer, dropping it in there, depression, anxiety, right alongside stress, cancer, whatever. I mean, that's just, that perks up an, an ear. It can be done in really subtle, easy ways as well. Steve, I agree. That That's something that I have recommended to faith leaders who don't think they have any of this in their congregation. I just encourage them to throw that into a congregational prayer, uh, whatever denomination they come from, and then watch what happens over the months to follow as people feel free to come in and speak to them. So guys, we could go on because this has been so terrific. I really appreciate the way that you've broken down these first two principles of the guide. Um, the Compassion in Action Guide, we will send you a link to that in the follow-up email that you receive from us. And um, we will also send you a link to our third webinar. You can register for our third webinar coming up Thursday, August 6th. So it's the Thursday instead of our regular Tuesday, uh, Thursday, August 6th. And uh, for that presentation, we will be talking about caregivers. And we've touched on that here, the Warrens and the impact of their life as caregivers to a son living with mental illness and how it changed their lives and how they are now changing the lives of others. So that will be our conversation on August 6th. We hope you will join us then. Be watching for the follow-up email from today's webinar. It will come in the next couple of days and it will include um, the recording from today's webinar and a link to register for our next webinar. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. It's really a privilege oh, to see you. Thank you, you. thank you for hosting. I that. wish we could be in person. Uh, but, but there will be a day again when we will be in person, and I look forward to that. God bless each of you and your work. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Take care.